Hi, I'm Tina Latona, CEO of WITS, and welcome to a Caterpillar's education series featuring Walsh Elementary, a look at one school's response to COVID-19. This event is part of our ongoing Ungala series, where we hope to engage the Chicago community on how we are adapting and evolving through these unprecedented times. Now, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping. I'm sure we're all used to this at this point. As we may know, all lines are muted. This panel is pre-recorded and there will be a live Q&A session at the end featuring myself and Principal Reynolds. So if you have any questions for that, please put them in the chat box. And if you are having any technical difficulties, please email alexandra at witschicago.org. I'm so excited now to introduce our panelists and I'll start with Principal Patricia Harper Reynolds, who was named Principal of Walsh Elementary in the Pilsen neighborhood in July 2018. She is joined by kindergarten teacher Audrey Bennis, who has been at Walsh Elementary for the last 10 years and began her teaching career in 1990. We are also super excited to welcome Walsh family, the Mays, twin, Elliot bo twin boys, Elliot and Atticus, and their mother, Laura. The panel is moderated by Anna Porta, who has been part of the WITS team for the last two years in both the program and the marketing department. I hope you enjoy, and we look forward to answering your questions on the other side. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to welcome our panel participants and some dear friends of mine to this conversation. Um, it's been about seven months since I've seen most of you in person, so it's really nice to reconnect in this new way. Um, we all know that Chicago Public Schools began remote learning um, in March of 2020 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and with a very interesting spring and summer, we're now back in school, the school year is underway. So in many ways, we've really had to redefine what school means. And I'm really excited to explore this idea through the lens of the Walsh community. So, to get started, um, Principal Reynolds, you have just entered your third year as principal at Walsh Elementary, and I know that community building is a really big part of your leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so how has the process been to maintain consistency in school culture um, within the remote environment, and what does it mean to be a principal right now? So in order to make consistent we've just kind of done what we've always done, right? The Walsh community in and of itself is just one that like comes together, just like when things are great, when things are chaotic, like we just always have a unique way of just kind of adapting to things and leaning on one another. So it's been about the same, just kind of super heightened. Um, it's been really good in terms of having parents and a network and a group of people that kind of like fully support like who we are and what we believe in. And so everybody is just kind of like come together to do what's in the best interest of our kids. Um, despite remote learning, the staff has never really complained, never really wavered. They've always been about like, what else can I do? Like the team has been phenomenal in terms of going to student homes and calling every kid every single day. I mean, we have Ms. Bennett on the call right now and um, I can't say enough about her and her dedication to those tiny people in terms of even just recording videos every day and doing just little calls so that they just didn't feel like they were forgotten. So it's just kind of how we operate at Walsh and how we operate in Pilsen as a community and as a network and just being able to kind of like lean on one another. We all miss our kids tremendously, but being able to like over communicate whenever possible, rely on the LSC, rely on parents, rely on each other to kind of get through it kind of keeps us all afloat, keeps us where we need to be. In terms of what it means to be a principal right now, some days I'm the janitor, <laughs> some days I'm the clerk. I've even been the teacher so far. If somebody had an emergency, I've had to step in and teach a class. Um, it means doing what you have to do. And I think principals around the city just kind of all were just like, okay, this is where we are now. This is what we need to focus on. The kids are what we need to focus on. Adult SEL is what we need to focus on. And being able to be vulnerable ourselves 
to say what we need and how we need to be supported, I think is really big on like where we are as principals, just in this city and what it means to be in this role. So just connecting the families, making sure that your staff has what they need, being able to say what you need, being able to take some time to self-care because you're internalizing a lot of other people's angst and anxiety, but making sure that the kids know that they aren't forgotten, making sure that families know that they aren't forgotten and making sure that everybody continues to see the school as kind of a community center or a community place where if they need to get food, they can get food. If they need a computer, they can get a computer. If they need somewhere to just cry and vent to because they see us as family and they have nowhere else to go, I'm okay with that. And then we'll figure out how to come to a solution to get through all of that together. So being a principal and building community and all of that just is really centered around like relationships and making sure that people feel heard, people feel valued. And it's just kind of an awesome place to be. I can't speak for every school in the city, but I can say that Walsh is unique in the way that we kind of just like fall in and say, okay, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? How can we help? And it works out. And then, you know, even our, comp our partnership with WITS, like not just because you're on this call, like, we didn't ask volunteers to send personal messages to kids. When kids received personal messages, like I got personal emails from parents like, hey, the Wiz volunteers sent my son an email or sent my son a video message, the tech co sent it. My kids was really, really, they were really, really happy to get that like, because they make those connections with those Wiz volunteers too. So just even when we got on our call, like Elliot and Atticus were like, I know, like they were happy to see you. So that part of community and that part of what makes Walsh Walsh is, is just, just what we do every day. Awesome. So it's it's something that you've already laid the groundwork for before this ever happened. So it's a matter of just leaning on those relationships as they already are and finding new ways to, to support one another. Absolutely. Um, awesome. Um, Mrs. Bennett, so you are a very experienced teacher, but you've not taught through a pandemic before. So this is it's new for everyone. Um, in what ways are you able to lean on systems and methods of teaching that you have as values for yourself in general, while also having to adapt to kindergarten instruction in the virtual setting? And how are you able to set classroom norms and culture, especially for the early learners, um, where this may be, or it is one of their very first experiences with school? Sorry about that. Ms. Reynolds, I want to thank you. If really, if it wasn't for my principal, uh, Ms. Reynolds, I really don't think I could have gone gone through this. So um, thank you. Um, anyway, I did write some notes because I'm not really great uh, with this, so I didn't want to forget anything. But um, I definitely wanted to continue to follow my values as an educator um, during remote learning, but I was really afraid. I, I really am scared. I did not know how this was going to work. But what I realized is that by following my values as an educator, actually remote learning has gone much better than I expected. So that's really um, great. But one important value that I do have is, as an educator is to make sure that my children have a sense of belonging and community. And although we're not in person, it's still really important that we know our students. So in the beginning of the school year, um, before the kids even began, we did a, I did a questionnaire for the parents, and it was up through Google Classroom, and um, most of my families did fill out the form, and, through, and I found out that some kids like dinosaurs, and some like to sing, and to dance, and to draw, and so because of that, I um, incorporate that in my lessons, and so sometimes we sing, we dance, we draw, and we sometimes read a dinosaur story. Um, something else to promote a sense of belonging is um, in the beginning of the school year, I do interview the students. We make these little cookies and each M&M and &M the cookie, paper cookies. And each paper cookie represents something about them. And I interview them. And then the students get to ask questions um, to their classmates. And they look forward to it. And it's really fun. Uh, so that's, and, now, and plus they learn about asking questions. And now also, um, like in-person instruction, I also, um, make a point of teaching classroom rules and routines. And some of the rules are different, but many are still the same. And, you know, for example, um, rules are important so we can all learn and we can all have fun. And to kind of continue to go back on those rules once in a while to just remind students. 
about that. And also, all of my children have a classroom job. Each single child, even during remote learning, has a job to do. And it's the same job for the week, and then they get to switch um, in the following week. And they really look forward to that. And I actually think that it's kind of promoted attendance because they know if they're not in school, someone else is going to do their job. So I think that's been kind of helping. And then another really important value is um, positive reinforcement. Uh, I really think giving compliments and telling the students what they're doing well is really um, keeps the students engaged and wanting to be at school. So that's something that's constantly I really try to continue to do. Um, another value of mine is I want my students to continue to have a love of reading. And I really want to thank uh, WITS because WITS has really helped develop literacy in um, my classroom in the past. And they did this by, or you guys have done this by providing volunteers to read to my students on a weekly basis. And it's something that, and I think Addis, Atticus and Elliot also um, did that when they were in kindergarten. And it's something the kids really look forward to. And there's books that they've never read before. And then they want to read those books. They learn about the author. So I really thought that was really important. I wanted to continue to do that when March, when that happened. And so Ms. Reynolds knows that knows this. I incorporate my own children, uh, my college students, my high school student, students, kids, my kids, to read to the kindergartners. And they really liked that. That was fun. Now they're in school, so they're not able to do that. But I do continue to read aloud to the students every single day during synchronous learning. Um, and it's actually one of my favorite parts um, of my day is when I do my read aloud. Um, and then what else did I want to say? Finally, very important, I want my students to have a love of learning and curiosity. And, um, and we do this by still having fun. You know, we do dancing, we do the drawing, like I said, and moving, and we do educational games. Um, I want them to love school, whether they're in person or whether or not they're um, at home. So despite so many differences that are happening right now, there are some things that stay the same and are still important. That's amazing. So it's it's not even that you need to have your physical classroom in order to set that culture, but you're still able to create those routines and think of some of those silver linings of being at home in order to get your students motivated um, and find some like personal responsibility within their classroom as well. Very cool. Um, I'm gonna ask a question for the whole group and I will start um, with Elliot and Atticus if you guys wanna answer first. Um, yeah. my, my question is, um, as members of a neighborhood school, you go to a school that is right in your neighborhood. Um, what does it mean to you to have community during this time? So you haven't been able to be in your school with your classmates, with your teachers, but where do you see community now? Um, during a time where you've been at home a lot and you haven't had those traditional routines that you have with school. I'm actually having a little trouble understanding what you meant by no, community. No, she, um, Jason, how do you feel about the, um, um, how I feel about the community during the pandemic is, is, well, in school, there has been a lot of problems. I mean, everyone must have had, like, one, one problem with their computers, but I'm okay, but I'm okay with that because, Mike, because as Miss Bennett said, there was synchronized learning, which has taught us a lot about someone, someone as we help each other answer answer math problems and ratios, or or when or when we're reading as we read in the in the group group and point out each um key details to the book. That's also kind of fun. So, and also, and sometimes I notice um, the synchronized learning is working because sometimes after school, me, Elliot, um, hang out with some friends and do a meet together and hang out, hang out. 
which I think would, is very helpful to communicate with each other. Even though, even though we can all admit that, that the pandemic has stopped us from, um, from going, going into school, well, real, real school, which, which we can all admit was much better than this, it still hasn't stopped us from being a community. But, but, but we could unlock much more stuff if, if we can go back to school, but this pandemic won't stop us. Elliot? Um, can you please say the question again? I'm sorry. No problem, Elliot. Um, so maybe I'll put it in some different words so we can think about it in a different way. Um, when we think about school and our school community, when I think about Walsh, I think about walking through the hallways and saying hi to people. Um, when classrooms are changing, you see friends. Um, sometimes you have a good day, sometimes you have not so good day, but you see all of the same faces as part of your school community when you're in school. And now that's really different now because we don't have the building that we're going to anymore. So how are you able to connect with others while you're in remote learning um, because you're in a virtual space? Does that help to clarify a little? Well, how I'm really able to connect is, um, I like this learning, but I, feel, but I really wish that we could have real in-school learning to really help us connect more and really, you know, have people say to us, be quiet, do this, do that write this down, write this down. Yes, how I'm able to really commute with the communities that I'm able to chat with my friends and in our community, it has been really helpful. And what I'm really thinking is, we need to open schools because they're opening restaurants, they're opening movie theaters, they're opening everything else but the school. Why won't you open the school? I mean, come on. Sure, there's this and that and that. I mean, close down a few things, but we need education and we need this social stuff and we need social skills to help us in the future. Go ahead. So what I was going to say, Elliot, is you made very good points, sweetie. Very, very good points, Atticus. You eloquently spoke as well. What I think Miss Anna is trying to get us to understand is, so if we, if, if, if in fact, I wish Miss Reynolds had some word in how this thing is ran. I don't, I can only control how I love you, right? If in fact, we find ourselves in a situation where we're in remote learning just a little bit longer, right? What can we do or what has been working for you in this setting that can kind of keep giving you the momentum to keep going, if, that, if that's a little bit better, Elliot. So if we had to stay in remote learning, if we had to kind of stay here just a little while longer, what are some of the good things that you can pull from it in terms of before we didn't even like have this platform we're using now for you to go to shift and change your classes? Like what are some of the good things that you can pull from the experience that we can carry into some things if we have to continue in this kind of learning stance? What are you thinking now? Um, yes, because with this um, pandemic, it's kind of unpredictable what will happen next. Because in the beginning of this pandemic, it was it started out as a small virus, virus, and for the last day of school, I didn't even know we were coming. We're going to go. That was our last day of school for a while. So if I was going to be a regular day, um, the unluckily the coronavirus pandemic um struck up up at the exact wrong time um sixth grade, which um is very important in your life if you want. To, um, to get good grades, good grades and life, it's a life and smartness thing. Things kind of complicated, but all I'm saying is that that um that it's okay that um it's kind of more harsh for the people for sixth to eighth grade because because most of the time time there has been a lot of important sixth to eighth grade or more that you need to do in order to get into college and get a good college like Northwestern and UIC, which is around here. And I bet I bet the the people in college aren't getting as much education as they used to do. I think interactive learning is important, but just in case that we stay in this um, remote learning, I think something pretty important is more communication 
which I think is something really important. Um, and I have to say, I also have one thing to say. Um, Miss Anna, is there like a wits for sixth grade? Because in fifth grade, we weren't really able to finish this fifth grade school year. And I really wanted to end it on a good note. And, and we really weren't able to. So can the kids who maybe were in fourth or fifth, the fourth grade kids, yes, they can go to a now, like when school back on, they can go to real, um, they can still go to the Tuesday Wits, which is going to a really good place and reading with mentors. What I am a little sad about is that, and what I'm really hoping for is that the sixth graders can also get like some, like can also get something like that, you know, like maybe on a, on a Thursday or a Friday and really just able to finish what they couldn't, which is um, finish like another what's year. And with this, I really hope that we can maybe read a lot more and learn a lot more. Thank yeah, you. that's but, Elliot, a, a great question, Elliot. I would love, let's talk a little bit more about this maybe at the end of our conversation, but um, it was really hard to have to end the year the way we did. It was hard for me too. I had a difficult time with, you know, not being able to say goodbye with anyone in person and not being able to finish out the year and some of the traditions that we have. Um, but as we've been talking about, it's kind of making those new traditions. Um, and yeah, I, I do, I appreciate all that you guys put into your WITS program and I, it made me sad too to have to end the year the way that we did. But let's um, pivot a little bit. So Laura, if I can ask you a question, um, what has it been like for you to have your home turn into a classroom? Because I know for many of our families um, all over the city, the home has taken on, you know, a whole new meaning and with students being in the home all day instead of leaving during the day to get their schooling there. What has that been like for you? Well, it's actually a different dynamic, but I guess we got used to it. Uh, it was quite easy. The, from school, we have a lot of help. They tell us like how to do it. If we have any problem with a computer, right, at the, right there we have help. So I think that is a lot easier. It changed a lot because now I have them 24 hours a day, which I love them with all my heart, but it's a little bit difficult, but I think it's, it's easy and we are getting used to it. It's something that we have to adapt to a better way. That's it. Awesome. Um, I am going to do another whole group question. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Bennis first. Um, we, we haven't had school in person in, like I said, about seven months now. Um, so if you think about your experience with remote learning, um, this up until now, are there moments or are there, have there been instances that have really motivated you or inspired you to keep going? Um, whether it's an interaction with a student or a particular lesson or, or you know, just a, an outcome that strikes or has struck you as particularly positive during this time. I'm still working on my technology skills. Um, that's improved. That's inspiring. Um, <laughs> But anyway, no, something that really has inspired me was an incident, an incident but, um, something happened about maybe midway so far. So like the third week weekend, I have been reading uh, Knuckle Bunny, and it's by Mo Willems. And it, I was talking about beginning, middle, end, and how the kids were really loving it. And one of my students said, that is my favorite book. And then maybe the next week, he pulls out the book. He had his dad buy it for him on Amazon. So that really made me feel so good, the love of reading, and they were excited. And so I think that that's, a, uh, that, that definitely inspires me. That makes me feel happy about that. And um, I think, uh, and then when I see them, they see each other, 
on the screen before in school before right before school starts or during a break and they talk to one another and wave I, I feel um there's some connections and that makes me happy awesome um principal reynolds i'll come to you for the same question if you're if you can think of a moment that sticks out to you or what's helped motivate you during um the past seven months about remote learning and and working from home so i don't work from home <laughs> i'm in the building every day but i think my my inspiration shifts in phases so like and let's say April or May, when I will be like taking my community walks and I will see like some of the preschoolers and they would be like doing chalk writing on the sidewalk and they would be so happy to see me and they knew they could like be like, hi, and it would be the little, oh my God, like there she is. And it would be like, okay, I miss and I crave like the love from the students. Like it's so just like overwhelming and affirming of what you do when they're happy to see you. Like they don't run from you. Like, oh, there's my principal. Like, but it's, it's so affirming. And then there are moments when, when I come across a parent and then they say, hey, I need some resources and I'm able to provide them the resources. Or if I get an email, like, just thank you. Like, thank the teachers. Like, thank you. Thank everybody for like being so super supportive and not like going crazy on me. Or just there, there are just phases and moments when I'm like, okay, we're doing something Right, like when we can find or locate a kid that we know have been having trouble and get them everything that they need and get them online and they're there every day. Like when I have like five days in a row, like I've seen this kid that I was like worried about, the teachers were worried about. Like those are my moments of like enlightenment where I'm like, okay, we are doing something right. So mine kind of comes in phases. I wish I had a great story about books. Ms. Venice will tell you and you know, like we pass out the Wits book packets constantly, but. I love reading, so that is super cute, but I just it just it just moves in phases for me and it's on levels for me. So from adults to like tiny people, like just I'm just always just like happy when I feel like when I can go home and share a story with my parents or my husband about like today something really, really great happened. Like despite everything that's going on in the world, today I kind of had a rose that bloomed from the concrete and now I feel a lot better. And tomorrow we can look for that rose again. But that today was that thing, like seeing Zelda or, you know, one of the kids just kind of like hanging out on the sidewalk or coming by and walking by the window and waving. Some days that's kind of what you need. So you kind of get what you need when you need it. That's beautiful. I think, you know, from what I've been hearing from a lot of different people, it is those moments of connection and the moments where you have an exchange with someone. I remember when I came to Walsh with the books, um, a couple of Walsh students were coming by to to drop things off and it was just it made my whole day to see them and um i saw some of your uh photos from the grad the kindergarten graduation and the eighth grade graduation that you know it really has still that connected community feeling and i i i think for a lot of us it is those moments of an exchange of some kind or you know a smile even that can really help make the day um Atticus and Elliot, if you guys want to share as well, what is a moment that sticks out to you um, that keeps you going and what helps motivate you? Um, moments that stick out to me is one of my favorite classes, which is reading. Reading is kind of a weird class to like since most of, my, of the people in my class don't really like it, but I'm actually really enthusiastic about reading. Right now, I'm reading Harry Potter. I just finished the second book, and I'm on to the third. And um, it's actually a pretty good read. And I think everyone should um, grab more classical and more more experienced books so they can experience the the um fun of reading. Because because sometimes there's this problem most kids, which which is that they um, don't like reading, which I think is pretty bad, and I think everyone should like reading. So I so I like it to see people, that, like in my class, reading um, reading complicated books like Percy Jackson and the Lightning King, or 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 the, or the Hobbit, stuff like that. So that's what music 
asking about stuff with me. Elliot? Um, one thing that stuff. One thing that's been really, I've been really enthusiastic about is I'm glad about school and all, but sometimes it just like after school, at like two thirty or five thirty or you know just when the school ends, when I just go onto my computer and just have a nice chat with my friends and just talk and talk about what we like and just talk about without really having to learn. <laughs> Because I like, because I love learning and all, but sometimes I just really want to just kick back, relax, and just talk with my friends and just have fun. Like show them pictures, watch something, or just do something. Something like sort of just like hanging out with them. It's like when you're on that meeting, in my opinion, it's like you're at recess, but you're not actually playing a game. You're just talking and having fun. So that's what I'm really enthusiastic about. One thing, in, like in school, what I'm really enthusiastic about is history and science. And in history, I really like it because one, we're learning about evolution and I would like to learn about, you know, homo habilis, homo this, homo that. And these are like really encouraging things because you might get this sooner or later in college in this. And then like 20 and, and then like 13 years from now, you're gonna be on a test that said, what were the first type of men? Come on, Ellie, you you learned this in school and you know it. You you saw this in school. You should know this. That's probably about right. <laughs> Homo habilis. Awesome. Great job, you guys. I love oh. you both. Said, um, Atticus, with you talking about your love of reading, I mean, we, the way that you get excited about your classmates enjoying books too, you can help to encourage them and give them recommendations, which is really cool. And then, Elliot, I feel the same way as you. I think one of the most relaxing and important things for me during this time has been to connect with my friends at the end of a long day, just being able to relax and, and talk about your day or just things you're interested in and stuff like that is very important for taking care of yourself. So thank you for that. Um, I would like to thank all of you so much for participating in this conversation. It was so wonderful to see all of your faces and hear from you. Um, I love any time we get to celebrate the Walsh community. Um, I'm very excited that Principal Reynolds is going to be staying on with us for some Q&A, and we are going to have 10 minutes for questions from the WITS community. Um, so with that, thank you so much, and we will talk soon. All right, hello everyone. Um, this is Anna Porta here again. I would like to welcome everyone to the Q&A portion featuring WIT CEO Tina Latona and Principal Reynolds of Walsh Elementary. Welcome, you guys. Hi, thanks, Anna. Oh, good afternoon. Good to see you virtually, Principal Reynolds. Thank you, Tina. Nice to see you, Gloria. Wonderful. So as a reminder, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat for our live listeners. 
And without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. So I have a question here from Minerva G. Um, I think this is a great one for both of you to address. Um, what is the next big step in successfully supporting our youngest and most vulnerable students to feel connected? Anna, um, do you want do you want to do you want me to answer that? Do you want um, Principal Reynolds to answer that, or just both, or? Yeah, whoever would like to answer. I think maybe hearing from both of you would be great. Okay, I go first. Yeah. Um, it's it's extremely important that the tiny ones feel connected because, like Ellie and Atticus said, the bigger kids will figure out a way to engage with one another. So currently, we have different things in place where. We have them, they come like once a month, like socially distant to pick up supplies and resources that their teachers leave for them. So they get a little time with each other and to connect with their teacher and see their teachers. Um, additionally, we have um, time built in the day where they get to engage with one another because most times they're split, their classroom is split from a.m. and p.m. So they do get to come together collectively as a group. Um, our most vulnerable students, are also included in everything we do. So it's not like we separate out our most vulnerable students. If you follow us on social media, you'll see they're probably the most active group in the building. Like they participate in this week's spirit week, like they're fully engaged in everything. So just making sure that we are, we're making those phone calls, that we're touching bases with family, that we're, although we can't have our doors open in the traditional sense, but we still have opportunities for them to kind of come socially distant, see one another and still feel like they're part of the space. We still see them almost every day because we're a food site. So we get to see parents that come in and they get to stop in and see myself and Mr. Woody, who is their favorite security guard. He's been here for 24 years. So he's probably been here when the parents were here too. But just being able to build that sense of community and connect with them has been something that we're really proud of and something that we continue to focus on. That's so great to hear. And I think that's something that when we, one of the things that WITS has kind of been really struggling with through all of this is that we're going through this as adults. And when we think about this, what's happening in the world right now, this is Atticus and Elliot's childhood. And when we hear him talk about, when we hear Elliot say that sometimes he just needs to kick back and relax and hang out with his friends, mm -hmm. We all feel that. We all get that. And I think that right now, the thing that sticks out to me is the ability to be consistent and think about what it means to be able to be there for each other at a distance and be there in a different type of virtual space. And I think that's something that's really hard for us. And so when we think about what WITS is going to do, even starting as next early as next week, trying to connect our mentors and our students virtually through Google Classroom and creating a consistent way for these students to be able to engage with adults and engage with other communities now that their world has become so small and let them remind them that there's so many people that are still out there that care for them. So when I think about what are we talking about is like, what is the next big step? I don't know if it's necessarily a big step as much as it's a series of consistent small steps. It's always being there, showing up when you say you're going to show up. It's that small virtual high five. It's the social distance lunch pickup line. It's this ability to let the students know and let everyone in this whole entire world know that we are still here. We're all still going through it. We're all still feeling it. And I think that's something that's really been important for WITS to do is to think about these incremental steps that we're doing to making sure that the communities that we've built for 30 years between Walsh and Bank of America and Walsh and Baird and our community volunteers there's ways for us to still do it in small ways that it doesn't always have to be big because really when it comes down to it, consistency. What's there every single day? I couldn't agree more. Amazing. Thank you both for those answers. Um, our next question here is from Jessica J. Um, this question was asked for Mrs. Bennis, but we will kind of adapt it to uh, Tina and Principal Reynolds to answer. Um, the question is, what has made the biggest impact for you and able to be successful as a teacher in remote learning? Or let's think about it as being a principal during remote learning time. Um, what recommendations do you have 
for other schools and supporting and differentiating for teachers. So I guess, um, Principal Reynolds, um, what has been kind of one of the major motivators for you in terms of your role shifting um, during remote learning as a principal? And in terms of leading the school, how are you able to differentiate for the different needs of the teachers at Walsh? My biggest is always turn it down. My biggest motivator is always my kids. Like my kids are priority one. I love my teachers, but like my kids are <laughs> they're my priority. Like they're my greatest stakeholder. Like they're 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 a full representation of who we are as educators and who I am as a leader. And they're always my 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 biggest like priority and my momentum and my reason for doing this work. Um, with, with regards to differentiating for teachers, it's one-on-one -on -one conversations about what they need. It's them telling me what they need and me not trying to infer or assume that I understand what they need at this time. It's me being compassionate and understanding that you may need to break down and I may need to be the person that's expressing empathy or sympathy sometimes towards whatever you're going through or whatever life is dealing with you um, or dealing towards you, whatever, you know. But I think a lot of it lends itself towards understanding that although teachers are educators, they're people and they're experiencing all of this collectively, just like our students and everybody else. So being able to let them communicate like, just the things that, that they need to be successful in this. Like I had a teacher that was struggling and I said, well, what is it that, what is the, what is the matter? Like, what is it that you need? They're like, I just need another screen. If I had two screens, I would be better at this. And I was like, oh, I can hit the easy button on that one. Like we can give you another screen. So like being able to just like take the time to pause all the busyness of what I do all day to kind of stop and listen to what families need, what teachers need. Like sometimes and it's just being able to decode it. And sometimes people don't always know what they need. You have to like talk them through it. But just being cognizant of the fact that everybody is experiencing all of this together in different ways, with different experiences and different home lives and different differences. And supporting them by giving them what they feel like they need and then working through it when that shifts. Awesome. Um, my next question is for Tina uh, from Ron Sonnenthal. How is volunteering changing in the age of COVID? And you can discuss this through the WITS lens and also just, you know, what you've seen and heard throughout the city. Um, hi, Ron. Ron is on our board of directors. So thank you for joining us, Ron. Um, I think that when we think about the landscape of volunteering, especially in a city like Chicago, when we think about the role that the community plays in building each other up, and they think about the legacy of WITS, that we were found on this concept of volunteerism and bringing communities together. And it's, I think that it is going to change. I think that we have to be realistic in the sense that like the concept of in-person volunteering is probably going to realize a significant shift for a number of years. I don't know when the next time we're going to see big volunteer events when we're going to Walsh Elementary and building a playground, or we're going to Walsh Elementary and we're painting the walls. But I think that what this space does allow, which is something that WITS has done for 30 years, is we can still create one-on-one -on -one connections in this way. And I think that it's so important to remember that the concept of volunteerism is often that large scope concept, but volunteerism can also be something as simple as like, I'm sure all of our hearts melted when Principal Reynolds said, I can only control how I love you. And I think that is what the concept of volunteerism is, is that there are new ways in which we can find that we can love and share for each other and that we can be there for each other. And I think that what WITS is embarking on this year in the sense of looking to connect our mentors and our students virtually, especially in a small group setting, which we haven't done, which we usually put students and volunteers together one-on-one -on -one over the course of the school year, this is gonna change the dynamic of that group. That changes the dynamic of volunteering for WITS. This is now a new way that we look at how we keep each other safe. This is a new way that we look at how we build community with each other. And I think that 
we're going to probably have to redefine what it means to be the largest organization providing volunteers to elementary age students in Chicago public schools and what it means to be a reading organization over a virtual platform and how long this might take. But it's going to be a balance. I think that we're all going to have to continue to adapt and we're going to have to continue to work through so many things in like, how do we get to that other side? You know, I think my question to the world is like, how do we get to that other side? Because like that hands-on volunteering is still part of who we are. It's still part of getting stuff done in this world. So how does that get done now? You know, how how does that get done if we're if we're not figuring out how to do it safely together? And so I think that all these small steps that we're taking and learning how to do this virtually, learning how to be around each other safely, it's going to hopefully make us more value what it means to share time with each other for an, a positive outcome. I really hope that every single person can feel that, that like when we're ready to do this again and we're ready to be in the same space together, that it's like overwhelming how that feels. Great. Um, my next question will be for Principal Reynolds from Carrie M. How can outside partner organizations be helpful and offer useful programmatic support without adding too much more to teachers' plates and parents' plates during this time? I think the, the ad may be maybe the wrong word because I think parents are looking for resources. Teachers are always looking for new resources. I think we move beyond the whole like proverbial plate and into this realm of like, what, what are other ways Like we talked about differentiation earlier? What are other ways that I can engage a kid that's not really functioning well in this platform? Or what are other ways that I can connect a family with resources that I wasn't able to do under this domain? So I think like understanding that it may involve different methodologies of delivery. So whereas everybody can't jump online at the same time to get the same experience. So maybe you have short video clips on how to access something. Maybe you have like small tutorials or one pages because that's the thing. We don't want to overwhelm people with like 20,000 steps or a lot of information at one time, but like creating like small videos or small clips on how you can utilize something. Also, we're always looking for ways to expand our technology usage and how we use platforms and things. Like just for instance, this week, a CPS updated Google in a way that really helped teachers tremendously, right? It created spaces for like to create classrooms and do all these things. So it's been like an evolving like need fix that's been like welcoming. So things like that, it doesn't feel like another something on your plate when it's something that you were like, this is the thing that I've been looking for. This is the thing that I need. So when you're issuing or coming up with different ideas and different ways in which to do things, think about it from a perspective of how can I make this an easier task? So like when Ms. Bennett's earlier said, like I'm not that tech savvy, but she's better than she thinks. Um, being cognizant of like, how many steps are involved? Like what is happening? And then if you want to like, when you think about volunteerism and how you can support, I'm lucky in the sense that I have a technology coordinator. A lot of schools do not have technology coordinators, right? So when it's time to update devices and do a lot of this stuff, they don't know how to do that. They don't have the capacity to do that in a simplistic way. So if you have a program that helps them do that easier, then I'm sure principals or teachers will be happy to say, hey, I can walk my students through how to update their laptops and so forth and so on. So just think in a way that you can use um, programs and platforms and resources in a more manageable way is probably the best way instead of thinking about it from a standpoint of adding more to people's plate. Because at this point, we're always looking for modified and easier ways to tackle a, you know, a complicated situation or something. Great, that's such a, a great perspective and I think as you're talking about making things more customizable and so that teachers um, or parents can just supplement and find the, the path of ease with using these resources is a really great point. Um, we have time for one more question. So I have a question from Patrick H. Um, I will ask first to Tina. Um, 
This question is about how for students, caring adult relationships at school are important for their social development. So how is virtual learning impacting this? And how can we help to minimize that impact? So maybe what is WITS um, offering right now to help um, minimize the impact of students losing um, some of those in-person connections? Yeah, this is, I think we can all agree. Um, there's a lot of educators on this phone call right now and that this is this is a really important topic. And I think that this is something that, you know, probably years down from now, there's going to be a lot of research on. But I think that, you know, when we think about the age bracket that WITS serves, you know, the primary age bracket that we serve is really third through fifth graders. We do go all the way from pre-K. We do have some eighth graders. But throughout that timeline for those students, they're really developing who they are. They're learning who they are in relation to people their own age. A lot of times, this is the first time that they are being introduced to adults that may be outside of their family. This is the first time that they're building relationships with people that are outside of their primary household. And this is the first time that they may be coming in contact with people that they see every single day outside of people from their neighborhood. And so this gives, people, this gives students the ability to test their boundaries, ask questions, how do I communicate with someone that I don't have a familial relationship with? And I think that this is one of the things that makes me so excited that WITS is figuring out with so much help from all of our CPS partners um, to continue to do this this year is that we're still being able to create that very safe space for students to test who they are and to find out who they are with a different adult and to feel validated and to be heard and to see a different perspective and also not just see a different perspective, but see, know that their perspective that they offer to everyone that they come in contact with means something. That what they have to say is important to the people that are sitting in front of them. I think that's something that we often miss is we often talk about it in that way. It's like, what do students get from adults? And I think that there's so much that we learn. I mean, sitting here watching Atticus and Elliot for like the last half hour, I got a science lesson. I've been told I need to read Harry Potter, which is a big deal in this office, the fact that I haven't read it. <laughs> you know, but it's like, I walk away from that and say, this is, this, this is an important experience for everyone involved. So it's not just the one way, what is the student getting from the adult? But it's also about what does the adult get from the student? And this reciprocity that you get in a situation like this, I think it's so important. So I think that from the perspective of WITS, we are so glad they're able to just find continuity right now. Just that we can connect last year. We have whatever, this, this thing going on now. <laughs> and then we're hoping to get to the other end because I think that ultimately we want to be sitting next to our students in their classrooms with colleagues and friends and, and students. And then we also look at what we're doing here as an expansion of what we've been doing for 30 years. You know, we're not going to stop trying to build community. This is a whole new way for us to do this. And I think that we look forward to that. And I think that we look for more ways that we can continue to serve students, not just around like the literacy skills, because I feel like the literacy skills for WITS are, they're secondary. They're secondary to what really comes out of this is the fact that someone shows up every single week and they are consistent and they are there to support you. They are there to listen to you. They are there to help you learn and they are there to learn from you. So I think that's something that like, I hope that these students also understand so much is how much we learn from them. So, I mean, the fact that we are going to be doing this like this in Walsh and in so many, there's other principals on here from other schools that we're working with. It's, it's humbling and very exciting, so much so. Awesome, Tina, Patricia, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, it was really incredible. And I will turn it over to Tina for some closing words. Um, thank you so much, Anna. Principal Reynolds, I mean, we have been best friends with your school for so long. And thank you, honestly, those kiddos. I've watched it, I have obviously I've seen it highlight. Um, I just do want to call out the WIT staff that really put this together, Sarah, Anna, Alex, Annie, and Kelly. Um, this was a really big undertaking and I'm, I'm so proud of you. 
I'm so proud of you guys every single day. So thank you to everyone that joined us. Um, this is a ongoing part of our Ungala series. So you are probably receiving some communication about other events that we have going on. We hope that you can join us. This is um, a way that we hope to continue to connect with the WITS community to continue to learn and grow and be part of each other at a distance while we move into these ongoing phases of this. But um, this was a blast. This was really fun, really exciting. And thank you everyone that showed up. It was so good to see so many faces and names. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you.